Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Today we are reading Godiva by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Make sure to check out yesterday's episode, Lady Godiva by Harry Graham. And now, on with our story time. I waited for the train at Coventry. I hung with grooms and porters on the bridge to watch the three tall spires, and there I shaped the city's ancient legend into this. Not only we, the latest seed of time, knew men that in the flying of a wheel cry down the past. Not only we, that prate of rights and wrongs, have loved the people well, and loathed to see them overtaxed, but she did more and underwent and overcame the woman of a thousand summers back, Godiva, wife to that grim earl who ruled in Coventry. For when he laid a tax upon his town, and all the mothers brought their children clamoring, if we pray, we starve. She sought her lord and found him where he strode about the hall, among his dogs alone, his beard a foot before him, and his hair a yard behind. She told him of their tears and prayed him, if they pay this tax, they'll starve. Whereat he stared, replying half amazed, you would not let your little finger ache for such as these, but I would die, said she. He laughed and swore by Peter and by Paul, and flipped at the diamond in her ear. Oh, I, 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 you talk. Alas, she said, but prove me what I would not do. And from a heart as rough as Isau's hand, he answered, Ride you naked through the town, and I repeal it. And nodding as in scorn, he parted with great strides among his dogs. She left alone the passions of her mind, as winds from all the compass shift and blow, made war upon each other for an hour, till pity won. She sent a herald forth and bade him cry, with sound of trumpet, all the hard condition, but that she would lose the people, therefore, as they loved her well. Then from till noon no foot should pace the street, no eye looked down, she passing, but that all should keep within, door shut, and window barred. Then she fled to her inmost bower, and there undid the wedded eagles of her belt, a grim earl's gift, but ever at a breath she lingered, looking like the summer moon half-dipped in cloud. Anon, she shook her head and showered the rippled ringlets to her knee and clad herself in haste, but down the stair stole on and, like a creeping sunbeam, slid from pillar unto pillar until she reached the gateway. There, she found her palfrey trapped in purple, blazoned with immemorial gold. Then she rode forth, clothed on with chastity, the deep air listened round her as she rode, and all the low wind hardly breathed for fear. The little wide mouthed heads upon the spout had cunning eyes to see. The barking cur made her cheek flame. Her palfrey's footfall shot light horrors through her pulses. The blind walls were full of chinks and holes, and overhead fantastic gables crowding stared, but she no less throw all bore up till last she saw the white-flowered elder thicket from the field gleam through the gothic archway in the wall. Then she rode back, clothed on with chastity, and one low churl, compact of thankless earth, the fatal byword of all years to come, boring a little agar hole in fear, peep, but his eyes, before they had their will, 
were shriveled into darkness in his head and dropped before him. So the powers, the weight on normal deeds, cancelled a sense misused, and she that knew not passed. And all at once, with twelve great shocks of sound, the shameless noon was clashed and hammered from hundreds of towers, one after one. But even then she gained her power, whence, reissuing, robed and crowned, to meet her lord, she took the tax away and built herself an everlasting name. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams.